thick of monkey pie. Hit got it on your screen if you haven't yet, please. Um, we're gonna have time for some information uh, sharing from our chief medical officer, Dr. David Morris, and then our director of infectious disease, Dr. Kakar will join him and we'll spend the majority of the time just doing Q and A and uh, share with you everything we know and uh, continue our commitment to meet with uh, everybody as we get more and more information, uh, particularly about the monkeypox vaccine. But before we get there, I want to start off with acknowledging a problem that we recently went through uh, and apologize to anybody who was impacted by it. Uh, when one of our physicians left recently, we temporarily closed our clinician panels to new patients with our insurance companies we contract with. We did this because we wanted to be sure that all of our existing patients got reassigned and reestablished to our existing clinicians before anybody who was new to our practice joined. This was a problem and some of you were impacted by it. Uh, one of our insurers uh, wouldn't allow our existing patients uh, to be reassigned um, when their physician left. So for all of you who went through that tornado with us, I deeply apologize. Had we known this was gonna occur, we would have never done this. Uh, and as soon as we realized the only way to get through it was to reopen our panels, we reopened. And so again, my apology if you were impacted by this. If you are still not assigned a new clinician, uh, please reach out to me. I'm D Brinkman at daphealth.org. I'll put it in the chat and I'll also put my direct line in the chat as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it, thank you so much, uh, Corey, I appreciate it, 9920418. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. David Morris. Good evening, Dr. Morris. Hey, David, uh, thank you for that. And Corey, if you can pull up the uh, PowerPoint presentation, And just as an introduction, uh, we've been having discussions at DAP probably for the last six or seven weeks about monkeypox. So this is very timely. Uh, we're, we're on a lot of groups and panels. We just got off the phone on a Zoom this after and, and a Zoom this afternoon to the Riverside County. So some of the things I'll give you towards the end will be updates from this. So this is the monkeypox talk um, for you guys for client conversations. And again, at the end, as David Brinkman said, Dr. Kakar will be on and Trent Brodus in our sexual wellness clinic. And the three of us will help navigate uh, questions and concerns that you have and try to share information with you. Okay, Corey. Uh, next slide, Corey. So the monkeypox is a virus, uh, and it's actually been around for many years. Uh, recently in the United States, um, and, and then occurrence of cases about May this past year. Okay, Corey. So what is it? It's a virus. It actually started in Africa, mainly in the Congo and mainly in Western Africa. Um, and then early cases outside of Africa were actually linked to travel and to imported animals. Um, it's related to the smallpox. It's called an orthopox, but it's a lot less lethal than smallpox. Um, and we know that the vaccination against smallpox actually confers protection for the monkeypox. Okay, next slide. So... We want to know how it's spread, and it's actually transmitted from animals to humans or from human to human, and it can be respiratory droplets or close contacts with infectious skin lesions. And I, I really emphasize the close contact with infectious skin lesions because that's how we think most of it currently is being transmitted. For the, the droplet transmission to occur, there's got to be face-to-face -face contact 
within six foot and some for, for someone for more than three hours. So it's that the don't have PPE or don't have a mask on. So just know it's going to be rarely transmitted by droplet, but it can. But pay attention to the close contact with uh, infectious skin lesions. So since May 13 in the United States or in other countries, there have been 9,000 reported monkeypox cases in 61 non-endemic countries. So that means outside of Africa, we now have over 9,000 cases and we now have 61 countries. And then I'll show you maps of where that is. Um, it, it's very interesting that in the US, the monkeypox confirmed cases have been found mostly in men who have sex with men, not exclusively, but mostly. And most of these patients have come through sexual wellness clinics, STI clinics, or local health departments and, and so on. Okay, Corp. Um, this is the first case recently um, on May 18, 2022, there was a Massachusetts resident that tested positive for monkeypox. That was the first one we know about, and he had returned from Canada. So that was the first we know about. There may be others, but that was it. And now globally, there's over 9,000 cases. In the U.S. currently, this is of last Friday, there's 865 cases in the United States. And if, if you'll look to the left there in Europe, it's Spain, Germany, United Kingdom, nice and France. Nice. And then there you go, United States, 865. So a lot more in Europe at this, at this point. And a lot of the contacts we've seen, a lot of the patients that have tested positive have traveled to Europe and they've traveled outside of the United States. Okay, Cor. Um, just a, a global map here. If you look at most of the, the numbered cases here currently, you see Europe, there's France, Germany, and the UK. Look at the United States, look at Canada and parts of South America. So that's where the, the endemic uh, situations are now. It's not considered a pandemic. Okay, uh, next, next slide. And this will be a map of the United States. And I looked at it and I thought, is this a political map of the United States, Republicans, Democrats, what's going on here? And it turns out, uh, most of the cases right now are in New York, 158 cases, California, 148 cases, and Illinois, 122, and then Florida's behind that. So you can look and see this, um, certainly California is impacted and East Coast, and we're seeing people that travel between the East and West Coast. So we're just very concerned about what's going on with this. And again, this is information as of last Friday. Okay, Cor. They say, well, what does this look like? So traditionally, and a lot of these pictures were actually taken in the early um, uh, cases that were in Africa, but this, these are quintessentially uh, pathognomonic just for skin lesions for monkeypox. So if you look at them, they're round, they're deep, and it says they have an umbilication. That means like a belly button. They have a dimple in them. And the, this sets it apart a little bit from other kind of lesions. It helps it be a little easier for us to look at and identify. They're almost always the same size and development, and they can be on a single part of the body, uh, pustules, face, or legs. Uh, we saw a patient today in one of our clinics, and he had lesions that looked just like this. They were umbilicated. Uh, he got swabbed, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, and usually there's a fever, and the fever happens before the rash. Uh, lymph node enlargement is common, like in your neck, in your cervical area, or in your ingual area down in the groin area. Um, and it says, so disseminated rash is centrifugal, meaning there's more lesions usually on the extremities in the face rather than the trunk or the central part of the body. You can have lesions on the palms and soles. And if you remember, syphilis also prevents, uh, presents with some lesions on the palms and soles, so it may be hard to identify from other rashes. Um, they're often described as painful until the healing phase, and then they become itchy and non-painful, and then they form crust on them. If you look at the third uh, picture on the top, 
you, you can see a scab forming under the nose and on the right cheek area. But these, again, they're pustular, they're round, they tend to be sort of firm, uh, slightly painful. And these can come about four to 10 days uh, after the exposure to the virus. So the incubation period, um, when there's the incubation, the, the, the patient is not contagious at all. It averages seven to 14 days, but can go up to three weeks. Um, and a person does not have to have symptoms and they may feel fine. That's very important. You could have monkeypox and have no symptoms for monkeypox until the lesions pop out. And then you say, what is this? Okay, Corey, for the next one. So we're finding, especially in the United States and with MSM, we're finding lesions in not typical places. So these are obviously on the penis, the genital area, and the thigh. And if you look at them carefully, you see a center for them. That's that umbilication. They're white. They're kind of pustular. You'll see a scab on uh, picture B that's forming and picture A. Um, and then um, also they're being seen in the anal, uh, the anal area too. So you can see these kind of exact lesions in the anal area. And, and so it begs the question about, is this a sexually transmitted disease? And what we say is currently, we just say this is skin to skin contact. If the skin is in the anal area or if it is in the penis or it is in the vagina, that certainly it can be spread that way. But again, in the United States, this is what we're finding. And most of the lesions are in the anal genital uh, area. Um, but be careful, ask questions and look for lesions like this on yourself or other people. Okay, Corey. So we test for monkeypox. If it's suspected, we collect fluid from the top of the dome of the pustules or the, uh, the dry, crusty scabs. We can actually uh, take those and put them in a sample container. And then we store them dry. And then there's no transport, no liquid to it. They've got to be kept cold. And then uh, we've been sending them to San Bernardino County, and currently LabCorp currently takes these. They go to our LabCorp, and then we found out today they're going to St. Louis, and there's a central lab for LabCorp that does all the monkeypox testing. And then all of these, no matter what lab they go to, they're all verified by the CDC, who's tracking all this. Uh, the California Department of Public Health is being consulted when we are sending the samples so they have a sense of what's going on, what's being tested, and so on. So we say, well, what do these look like? And this rash can look like chicken pox. It can look like syphilis lesions. It can look like herpes. Uh, there's another uh, disease that's called molluscum, and same thing it has an umbilicated pustule on it. So it helps if a trained clinician and people suspicious for this and with the uh, radar looking for this to say, is this suspicious for that? And if it is, we go ahead and sample it and, and test it. Okay, Carr, thank you. Uh, prevention and treatment again. So it's standard contact droplet Airborne precautions should be initially, uh, initiated in any hospitalized patient with a rash like this. Um, uh, number two is probably the most important thing on this particular slide is to avoid the skin-to-skin -skin contact. Uh, you can get this from touching shared fabrics like sheets, bed linens, towels, and so on. Um, and then I would suggest, you know, Talk to someone if they have a rash, look for this, see if anybody you think has it or if you have it, and then um, be careful if you come in any contact with someone that has it, and then you can seek consultation or testing for it. Um, ask questions. You know, we say it's okay to ask somebody, are they HIV positive or do they have herpes or it's okay to ask people. Um, and it's okay to look for rashes. And all you're doing is protecting yourself. You're not being political or judgmental, but just uh, have your radar up and know this is going around. Um, back to basic, washing hands, soap and water, and alcohol-based sanitizer after you've had a, if you've had a presumed contact. Um, 
and to know that monkeypox is fatal in less than about 3% of the cases. So unlike COVID, unlike a lot of other diseases, this does not have a high mortality rate associated with it. So in September 2019, there's a modified smallpox vaccine that was approved for the prevention of smallpox and monkeypox because monkeypox has been around and they've tested against the monkeypox. So it's the old smallpox vaccine, but it's being used for monkeypox. So we talk about post-exposure prophylaxis with the vaccine, and it could be considered in an individual basis, administered up to 14 days after exposure. Uh, the, in its best effective time to give the vaccine is four to seven days after the exposure. And I know this is confusing, uh, and it's also counterintuitive. Why would you give a vaccine to a person um, that has had an exposure? And the answer is this vaccine helps shorten the, uh, the length of time that you have the illness and also the severity. Um, we found out today the guidelines currently say if you're symptomatic and especially if you're very ill, the vaccine won't work as well. And then there's a antiretroviral pill or capsule to take instead. Uh, and then I'll talk about that in a minute. So there are three antiviral drugs that have actually been shown to treat it if you have it and you have a severe case. Uh, first line is the tecovirumet. Uh, that's the one that's really uh, av available through the county health departments and the state of California and the, and, uh, the CDC's stockpiles currently. So we have a vaccine and we also have a treatment for severe cases. Um, and again, this antiviral is reserved for very severe cases. Most people that have monkeypox have mild cases. Uh, most resolve, I think, and, um, and then the decision is, do you need the vaccine after you've had it? Do you need the pill or the, the capsule after you've had it? Or do you walk through it and get nothing? And then the other question is, what about MSM and what about sex workers and what about doing PrEP like we do for HIV? Can you take these? We think the direction in the future is that it'll be available for MSM, will probably be available for sex workers and people that feel that they're at high risk to get this. Currently, the vaccines are given to people that have known uh, disease or that have known contact, that they've had contact tracing through CDC and in our area, California uh, Department of Public Health. Okay, um, Corey, we can go to the next one. Um, so like we have PrEP and we have PEP for HIV, we have these that are, that are out there to be used. For the pre-exposure currently, most of the cases, most of these medications are going for high risk people. These are people that work in vaccine laboratories, people that work in uh, contaminated areas, people um, in hospitals, some uh, uh, clinical people that are, are in clinics that are seeing high rates of this and so on. And this is the area that we are hoping and we're advocating and we're looking at er other areas of the country that the, we are advocating that this PrEP be available for people with a higher risk for it. So the PEP, the post-exposure is if you have prolonged contact with a known confirmed case. Uh, and, and, and this is the Genos, J-Y-N-N-E-O-S. This is the, the Genos vaccine. Uh, you'll hear a lot about it. That's what's currently uh, in the stockpiles. And then this Tecovirumet that we talked about is the, is the capsule that you could take by, by mouth for that. Uh, I'll come back to the discussion about advocacy at the end of the slide. Okay, Corey, thank you. Um, so the two current vaccines, the Genos is the one you'll hear a lot about. So it's an attenuated live virus, uh, which means it's it has a lot less side effects and works just as well. It's two doses, they're 28 days apart. There's no associated cardiac risk with this. Um, and it, it doesn't leave a mark on you. 
the other vaccine that's actually in stockpiles for bioterrorism for smallpox is a live vaccine and it's contraindicated in anybody that has impaired immunity and, and they say probably if you have hiv even if you have big numbers big cd4s unsuppressed probably this live vaccine is going to be contraindicated for you so those are the two um, that we have and the genos is the one to really look at to know about to be educated about and know that this is currently what they have at the riverside county uh, 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 public health and state of california and these are nationally what are being made and made available okay Corey, thank you so as of uh the 11th we've got two known and i've heard three to five in the last two days cases in Riverside County and Los Angeles, 60 cases confirmed in all of California so far, 148. Um, Riverside County let us know today they have uh, 540 vaccines. California has over 2,600. I'm not sure how much of that's in LA County, how much is in Saf San Francisco and S Sacramento. But we, we got confirmation today that Riverside County has 540 doses of the monkeypox vaccine. Um, the other thing at the, at the bottom is that commercial labs now are able to test. Uh, this is step in the right direction. This is also memories of COVID. You know, in the beginning, it was limited testing, and then it was commercial labs. Well, the same here. It was limited to CDC and uh, health department labs. Uh, ours was San Bernardino, and as of last week, this opened. I know LabCorp currently does the testing, and we've already sent uh, two two uh, testing to the to the labs here at, at the DAP LabCorp that have then sent them on to their central lab testing. Okay, Corp. So there's a huge federal response going on currently. And a lot of this is identifying cases, people that have this, and they do the contact tracing. Uh, they're doing the case confirmations, not just people that think they have it, but test positive in the tracing. Uh, there's actually a global coordination going on with Europe, with all countries, with Africa, not just the United States. Um, and there's a big push to really raise the awareness among partners and people that are disproportionately affected communities and the public, and this would certainly be the MSM population. Um, federal response is in this prevention and control. And then currently they facilitate the access to the vaccines and the therapeutics. So they hold the, they hold the keys right now to all of this. And we'll talk about you know what's next and what DAP can be doing and what we are doing and what we'll probably be doing in the near future. Okay, Cor. So what's DAP doing? Uh, we have a, first of all, we have a monkeypox task force that meets every two weeks, but we're really updated every week. And we are joining national CDC sites, Riverside County, state of California. Um, we're watching what's happening in Washington, D.C., and New York City, and San Francisco, and L.A., and we're working with RIVCO to help advocate on the state level and the national level to get these vaccines, and we're very interested in advocating for a large number of vaccines quickly. Um, um, uh, to this area for PrEP. Um, so we're currently also collaborating with Riverside County to become a vaccine storage center. Uh, we have the freezer to keep these and store them here. We also have the availability and staffing to administer the vaccines here. So we have to work with them and their supplies on their timeline. Um, and we will be working side by side with them. They chose, uh, they've called us, uh, worked with David Brinkman and myself on us being a site to get these. And we're kind of at the front of the line to do that. Um, so we're now testing at our clinics. Uh, most of our tests have been done in the Orange Clinic, the Sexual Wellness Clinic, but we've also done testing in the green and blue. 
And then we are all keeping up with the rapidly evolving CDC, California Department of Public Health and Riverside County guidelines. And stay tuned because just like COVID, these, will, these are rapidly development. Things change every week. Uh, ideas change uh, pretty quickly. Availability. Uh, I've been watching uh, things going through the White House, and there are uh, th they're increasing the manufacturing of of the the vaccines. Uh, uh, so, and they're talking about 1.2 million vaccines to be available. So, just like COVID, just like the beginning, just like the vaccines, it's a slow start, and then it goes up pretty quickly. And all of us are trying to stay ahead of uh, ahead of this. Okay, Corey. Um, that's my basic presentation. I'd like to look at the chats here. Um, let's see what we have, and then we'll go from there. Uh, and then, um, Dr. Kakar and Trent, are you on? Because I can't, I can't see. I can only see what's on the screen here. I'm here, Dr. Morris. Okay, uh, Trent, would you like to add anything that would, um, from your perspective, working in the Orange Clinic and kind of what you're seeing and the questions that you're being asked, and to enlighten uh, uh, people in this conference. Well, I think a, a good way to start is there's a couple questions over in the chat. One of them says, can you catch it from having sex with somebody who has monkeypox but shows no rashes or lesions at the time you had sex with them? Well, we know that it can be transmitted through uh, large droplets, so it's possible. The lesions are probably the most uh, you know, common way of transmission but uh, we do know that it can be transmitted through large droplets. And then there was about underwear nights at bars. So yes, we've seen patients that have been to sex parties who transmitted through guessing naked contact, but underwear or, you know, we know that uh, sheets and sharing bath towels is not suggested because bacteria and viruses can be transferred on those are called fomites. So yes, on fomites, such as blankets and sheets and sleeping in the same bed and sitting in the same areas. Uh, swimming parties. I'm guessing swimming parties means um, probably naked swimming. Or topless. Yeah, topless. Okay. Topless swimming. <laughs> so I'm going to say yes to that. Unless everybody keeps their hands to themselves, but I doubt that happens. Okay. Uh, smallpox. Yeah, I've got. I, I can answer oh, that one. Your car, take the one on the vaccine from um, smallpox. Somebody that got smallpox vaccines, and then people with eczema being at higher risk for severe. Is that? Uh, yeah. I have not heard that about eczema, but we would think that any break in the skin is uh, yeah. another potential. Yeah. So Trent. Um, one of the things they said on our Zoom today, they said that people with atopic dermatitis and eczema could be at risk for having a higher level of disease and would be considered for the oral treatment. And that was a surprising thing that she said to me. So that was good information. Yes. Um, the screen moved. I'm sorry, I lost my spot. Bay Area is being distributed all, and also why in the Bay Area is it being distributed to all at a bathhouse in Berkeley, and why is it so available in San Francisco? You can just go get the vaccine. I yeah, think. I can. I can answer that. Um, we asked that same question today, and it turns out each area, LA, San Francisco, um, Riverside County have a limited amount of vaccines. And since those are the much bigger cities, they have much more vaccines given to them currently. And so they're using them for PrEP currently. Um, we think that's the future. We think that's coming pretty quickly, but you have to have the vaccines to give them and they have to be available and they're controlled by CDC and they're controlled by the, the county health departments. So that's the allotment currently. And again, there's 500, and 48, something like that uh, in Riverside County currently. 
Um, the question about immunity, yeah, if you're in your 50s and you had the original smallpox vaccine, it really, we think, provides very little current immunity to this. Um, and I've asked that question three times nationally, and I get the same answer every time. It probably doesn't protect you if you had your original smallpox vaccine. And Trent, you want to go, let's go through some of the other questions here. Can you make sure to read the question because when in the recording, um, they're not going to be have access oh, to the okay. written question. Okay. Yeah. So read it and then answer. Yeah. One one of the questions was why is so much vaccine directed to New York City or withheld? And so again, it's a large city. They have large uh, amounts giving to them, and they uh, again they were i can remember they went through almost 2000 vaccines in a couple days and there were riots in the street with people saying we deserve to get our monkeypox vaccine why are we being left out so it's it, it it's a matter of it's a matter of distribution and availability so the the next question was is it income or don't we know yet so the answer is it has been found in semen, and it also has been found in vaginal fluids. Um, it's still not labeled as a sexually transmitted disease. And so the, the rest of that issue is to be determined. But small amounts and traces have been found in at least two isolated cases that I know about. How would someone know they are carriers if they have no lesions? And the answer is you wouldn't know. And that's the that's the hard part of this. If you're asymptomatic, you don't have a rash, you don't have a lesion, and you have it. Now, again, you pretty much have to have the rash and pustules and or vesicles or um, scabs to transmit this. So if you don't have that, you probably can't transmit it. Uh, does having a smallpox vaccine as a child protect you? The, the essential answer is no. There may be low-grade immunity, but the basic answer is no to that. And we've answered the San Francisco, Berkeley question. So at what point after infection do you become transmissible? And that is about four to seven, 10 days. And it's when you have the, the rash, it's when you have the lesions, that's when you become transmissible. Uh, I see a question here to David Brinkman. Can you comment on access to services like behavioral health, acupuncture, which close when DAP required referrals from doctors? Um, I would say come back to that. It's an important question. Let's get through the monkeypox vaccines and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. And then while we have Dr. Kirkar here too, I would, was going to ask her if she's, uh, I know that she works inpatient for both uh, Desert uh, Hospital and Eisenhower, and if they've seen any patients coming through the hospital or any admissions, patients who are sick with monkeypox that require hospitalization. That's a good question, actually. Um... There has been no hospitalizations um, with this uh, diagnosis, but we do see rashes of different types. And we have our guard up to think about, uh, you know, um, check for monkeypox if that uh, works out. But we do see patients with rashes that come in sick. So, so far, uh, none have been diagnosed or uh, treated uh, for monkeypox. Um, I just want to say that, uh, you know, a um, lot of discussion about um, MSM, but the most important part about this is skin to skin contact, which includes sexual. So the basis of uh, transmission is not gender based or sex sexual orientation based, but majority of the uh, cases outside of Africa were diagnosed in the uh, sexual um, clinics. So um, there is a chance that we're not uh, quite sure how far um, the extent of infection is in common public or general public. 
but the point of all this is to raise awareness, not just to our community, but also to our healthcare workers and people who are um, uh, taking care of patients in settings outside of uh, sexual health or sexual wellness, um, such as you know, urgent cares and emergency rooms and things where um, you know, anyone could present with uh, an infection. So I just wanted to say that um, from the hospital side, fortunately, um, majority of the patients uh, that might have monkeypox would, um, you know, not need to go to the hospital. But uh, if they do, we uh, want to make sure it's, uh, that we are aware of it. Uh, that we can screen for it, we can isolate and, uh, you know, reach out to, um, to treat uh, if, uh, if those are the high categories such as pregnant uh, women, children, or um, infection uh, lesions in the eye or uh, secondary um, sepsis, things like that can be, um, uh, you know, considered. But thank you for asking that question, Trent, uh, from the hospital side. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's something we want to be aware of. Good. So another question was, uh, I think this was Terry, let me get back here. Can we travel to LA or San Francisco to obtain the vaccine since they're more abundant there? Um, I've had two patients that I know that have gone to LA to get the vaccines and they got them. Um, but again, we don't know what they're in. They did not check their driver's license or see where they lived or any of that. But we don't know what their supply is. Um, we don't know. Uh, we know that their public health departments are, are, are giving them out and they are using them as prep. So, you know, th that that's an avenue. But there's no guarantee if you go there that you'll get one. But I know it can be done. Uh, Francis says, how can the general public get the vaccines? And the basic answer is currently the general public cannot get the vaccine um, in general. Uh, and it's being allotted again by the departments of public health and through CDC currently. Um, at some point it may open up, it'll probably open up to prep first for the high risk uh, groups of people. Um, uh, Todd says, just a shout out to DAP for being so proactive to educate our community. You know, it's in DAP's DNA to do that. We've done it with HIV. We've done it with SARS. We've done it with COVID. We'll do it with monkeypox and whatever the next endemic or pandemic is, we'll, we'll do the same thing. So just know we're, we're there. We're pushing for this. You know, we're, we're concerned that this also will affect, you know, marginalized populations and lower income populations and uh, people of color and people of, you know, um, uh, MSM population and sex workers and so on. Uh, so we're definitely advocates and we definitely care. Um, so Santiago says, does it only affect skin or can it affect mucosa as well? Um, Dr. Kakar, will you take a stab at that one? Sure. Um, yes, it can affect uh, mucosa, but mostly the skin, uh, skin and genital area. Uh, mucosal uh, lesions can be difficult to diagnose and, uh, of course, uh, should be considered a possibility. Um, they can also be um, um, inside, uh, meaning, you know, vaginal or uh, difficult to see areas. Uh, but, um, you know, the diagnosis, uh, of course, is that uh, depends on the classic lesions and trying to um, take the sample, send it to CDC. Uh, a CDPH and uh, confirm. Um, there's a question about um, um, a stigma, which I thought I wanted to address. It's uh, the you know it's most challenging to um, to um, spread the right information without um, stigmatizing. Um, the purpose of 
a open discussion like we are having right now is to make sure to um, help community protect themselves uh, regardless of um, the MSM, uh, the words that are stated or, um, or the way to understand how the disease spreads um, is uh, not due to. Um, what we don't yet know is, is that, are there anybody else uh, besides MSMs that uh, we're not uh, seeing because they, they are not diagnosed, uh, do we know for sure? So it is extremely important to, um, to educate one person at a time and as many as we can to, uh, to do this without, you know, pointing out as a stigma. Uh, I don't know how it can be done, but this is our intention. Yeah, Dr. Cart, um, Jeff Miller says, are the symptoms more severe in people with HIV? Um, I think that, um, I don't think that it is more severe in, particularly in HIV, but I think that if HIV is not controlled or untreated HIV, there could be uh, worse outcomes or uh, progression, but I, I don't know that um, we're seeing that it is behaving more aggressively in HIV. Um, as far as I know, I have not seen that yet stated. In patients who are controlled, they are at equal risk for getting the infection and having similar natural history of uh, treat, you know, of um, the disease process, which is self-limiting between two to four weeks, uh, most lesions go away in majority of the cases. There have not been any deaths reported yet also in the non-endemic countries, which um, again, uh, is all I know right now but we don't know what we don't know. So I'll stay with that. Um, our friend Nicholas Snow says, the people who have tested positive for monkeypox in Riverside County, uh, do we know if they were exposed locally versus traveling outside the area? Uh, one I know was in LA and, um, and then one I know was local and was involved in late June um, uh, in, in this area. Um, and so that, that's, that's all I know about that. Um, uh, Dr. Kakar Arnold asked, how is Eisenhower addressing the issue? I think uh, uh, from the hospital side, um, you know, they are supportive of DAP and uh, collaborating efforts to, um, uh, to support the the treatment uh, prevention and vaccine uh, acquisition in, in terms of advocacy. Um, I'm not sure that uh, there is any particular role that um, the hospital plays, both um, Desert or Eisenhower, but I know that, that they would be supportive of um, the community efforts to obtain vaccinations. Um, it is more of an issue around uh, sexual wellness clinics, outpatient clinics, um, uh, you know, uh, making aware of uh, physicians to participate in spreading education and uh, uh, methods of recognizing the disease, thinking of the differential diagnosis, um, et cetera. Uh, Michael B says, you mentioned that you can't transmit it unless you have lesions. Can you transmit it prior to uh, with oral droplets or with droplets with semen? What about oral contact kissing? Uh, again, you really need to have the skin to skin. You need to have the lesions. That's sort of where the action is on this. 
And again, it's very hard to get this through the droplets. If you saw the criteria, it was three hours, it was without a mask, it was uh, within six foot. And so I wouldn't be so worried about the droplet part uh, as I would be the skin lesions. Um, once a person gets the skin lesions, JR asks, how long before they heal? I think that's about a week to 14 days uh, for that healing process to happen. And they go from the, to the rash, to the pustules, and then to the scab formation, and then they heal up. This is, am I hearing this correctly? You're indicating that you cannot transmit unless you have a rash. Dr. K, would, do you mind taking that one? Because that's a very delicate question. Sure. So, uh, so far, um, you know, it is uh, most important to recognize not just the skin to skin contact alone, like touching, but prolonged um, at least several hours. So um, that is the mo most important part. So, you know, touching wet surface or any, any surface or who might like Trent mentioned, you know, if you touched it, but it's transient and you washed your hands, you probably would not. But that is the reason why in sexual activity, you're seeing lesions in the genital area. So it is prolonged sick, uh, uh, skin to skin contact. That is the primary method of transmission. Um, we would otherwise see a lot more cases, I'm sure. Um, but I think that respiratory droplet is mentioned because if you are in intimate sexual contact with someone, you're also in the same uh, vicinity mm -hmm. to be able to breathe the respiratory uh, dro droplets. So it cannot be just respiratory. It is not. <clears throat> it is not through sexual exchange of semen either. It is skin to skin for prolonged period mm -hmm. and with lesions that are infectious. Uh, in fact, in the incubation period, it is not transmissible. So, uh, and it, it is um, in theory, you know, it is present in say respiratory secretions or in semen, but in, in what we see clinically, it is in places where the skin is the main method of transmission, skin to skin contact, prolonged uh, contact several hours, three to six hours, like Dr. Morris's uh, presentation said, and it's the lesions that are infectious. Once the lesions are scabbed, it's also no longer infectious. So wet lesions are infectious compared to dry or scabbed lesions. Yeah, Nicholas uh, asked the question, how do we fight the new stigma being directed at MSM because of the way the story is being reported in the media? You know, for over 10 weeks, we've been having these discussions. And every time we have a Zoom, whether it's local or national or anything, it's always brought up, you know, and the idea is to not say this is a gay disease because we're, we're not saying that. We're saying that this was found at uh, sexual wellness clinics and testing centers, and it was mostly MSN that were being tested. But we don't want to say this is a sexually transmitted disease. We don't want to say this is a gay disease. And that stigma, it's a very fine line to walk on um, to alert the community, to educate people, but at the same time, not go down that path of stigmatizing to people. So that's a very, very current and very important part of the discussion. Um, let's see, Brian, please give a timeliness when you believe mass vaccination will be available. You know, that's very interesting. We asked uh, the experts today on that, and they said, we think new bigger batches should be in the vaccine within eight weeks but nobody's committing to a timeline. 
we know that nationally, and this is coming from the White House, we know that the, the manufacturers are, are puncting them out and pushing them and be in the pipeline. But uh, the estimation we got today was about eight weeks, but don't hold me to that. Um, we will push for these. We'll push for as many and as fast as we can get uh, as, as we can get them. And at the same time, you know, not being hysterical about it and not being uh, getting crazy about it and being measured and work with, you know, we don't want to work against Riverside County or California Department of Public Health or the CDC. We want to work with them to get this thing done. You know, the sooner the better, and we understand the urgency of it, and we understand how important this is, and we may just be in the front door of this right now. Um, Omer says, can we get it from public bathroom and public transportation? That's a no, Dr. Kakar. That's a basic no. Right. I yeah. think that, um, you know, again, it's skin to skin, it's uh, prolonged. That's the other a very important word in the understanding of transmission. Uh, Camden says, how many vaccine doses will be available in August? I've heard uh, the Danish firm is making and remodeling their facilities. Biden has asked for 2 million doses by the fall. That's the same thing that I'm reading and that I'm seeing also. 2 million doses by the fall. Um, uh, Stephen is saying thank you, uh, Dr. Morris, and to our group for doing this really important and vital presentation. We're so happy that DAP is on the forefront of this current crisis. The question about research at DAP Again, I'll have to come back to that. I can't do it on this monkeypox at the front end. If we have time at the end, we can go back to the other question uh, that was asked of David here. Um, uh, let's see. It was a question about research, and right now I want to do the monkeypox. Um, it takes two doses, right? Yeah, the, the main vaccine that's being given out, it is two doses. Uh, Nicholas Snow says, are you reaching out to local media to guide them in a way that they're reporting the story? And the answer is definitely yes. Uh, we're having weekly talks with the Desert Sun and our marketing department and through my chart messaging and through our um, website and so on. So we're definitely talking with the local media and trying to make sure that they understand that we're, we're advocates and we're, we're, we're trying to stay on top of it and help everybody. Uh, Francis Ng says, will the skin be back to normal looks after recovering or does it leave marks? Um, I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, yes, scarring can be um, present for longer than, um, you know, when the scab falls off. And, uh, but it, it's uh, long term, most of the scars will go away. Okay. Uh, next question is, does PEP also require two doses? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, next question, how can you get a copy of the transmission? I'm not sure I understand what that question is. Uh, copy of this presentation, Dr. Morris, I think. That the... Yeah. Um, I think we're going to probably make the, it's being videotaped. I think we're going to make it available certainly on our website and we'll see, we'll see. Um, you can email Corey to find out also how to get a, how to get a copy of this because we're very happy to share it. Uh, can you get the virus through a blood transfusion? I'm not aware of that. I'm not either. Uh, uh, next question is skin but skin to skin before lesions are not transmissible. Skin to skin before lesions. Yeah, the question is, is before you have the rash, if you have contact skin to skin, can you still get it? Dr. K? No, so, yeah. uh, you know, before the lesions are the most infectious. And uh, sometimes if the lesions are too small or like uh, we saw some of the lesions that are being seen in the non-endemic countries and not the classic ones like uh, in Africa. So many uh, doctors are being coached about uh, the appearances of lesions that can mimic 
uh, other diseases, but, uh, you know, or they are not classic, but, and are too small, but transmission occurs with the lesions because those are the ones that are, you know, highly infectious. Uh, next question is, is kissing more contagious than breathing droplets? In other words, could they get it more from kissing than if they were breathing the same room in the same area for a long period of time? So um, lesions, if they are present on the lip or on the face or in the area of the face, those are contagious. So one can say that any sexual or intimate activity where skin to skin contact with lesions are likely to be high risk for infection. Yeah, one of our participants says, thank you for the valuable information and we will need to continue to get all this factual information out. And again, that's where we are. We're in an educational campaign right now because education is power knowing and protecting yourself is power. Uh, let's see, can we get a copy of the presentation? Yeah, we've been through that. Um, uh, one viewer says, do you offer meningitis vaccines? The answer is yes, we do. Uh, another question is, uh, if PEP and PrEP requires two doses, when is optimal strength reached? And I, I think that means when are, when are you fully protected once you've had both of the doses? Uh, recently asked this question and the answer was two weeks after the final dose. So six weeks from your initial dose, given that you have your mm -hmm. booster or second vaccine at the four week mark. Two weeks later, you'll be fully immune or have full immunity. Uh, one viewer asked, how long before the lesions go away? So, um, you know, majority, 70 to 75% people, uh, most lesions will go away between uh, 14 to 21 days. There are outliers on either side. Some people will heal more quickly and others up to four to six weeks. Um, I recently um, had a question about someone whose most lesions healed but one, and one lesion uh, was not healing. And so the question was whether it had secondary infection or um, what, what was the uh, reason? And it was only some days. So what's your question? How often are, do people get lesions in their mouth? Do, if there are lesions in the mouth, what about kissing? I would imagine if it's oh. not skin to skin, it's a mucous membrane. Mm -hmm. like a yep. yep. Right. Or if there are lesions in the mouth. Okay, I think that's it. We're at the end of the hour. Um, there were there was uh, one question about research at DAP and um, I'll be glad for the person that sent me that. If you'll send me a personal email uh, at dmorris um, at daphealth.org, I'll be I'll be glad to uh, to answer that or to have a, a just a telephone call to talk about that. And I'm I'm glad to do it. There was one other question here. I think that's it. Yep. That's, that's it for, for this. Uh, any other last questions, closing remarks, Corey? Just some feedback um, and suggestions to make the, um, the medical building handicap access accessible with automatic doors. Um, this has been um, an issue for this person, you know, for somebody with a mobility scooter. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So in the clinics, we do have double doors, but I think the question is, you know, can we get those doors that slide open and you push the button to people get through? Uh, I'll, I'll take that question um, 
up the chain and we'll have the dis we'll have a discussion about it so it's a it's a it's a it's a great question so the other question from the beginning um access to behavioral health services and services such as acupuncture, which require DAP referrals from doctors. So I, I suppose this client is not a patient here and um, is wondering why that there's a block in access if you're not a patient, but a client. So I'm happy to take that, Corey. Um, so when we think of primary care at DAP, we think of it in the most holistic way, right? Uh, dentistry is primary care, behavior health impacts primary care, pain management, addiction, uh, mental health, all those things help us create the most holistic approach to providing primary care. And so there are programs such as uh, access to mental health, that are restricted for patients of ours who are also getting medical care. So our physicians and clinicians can partner with psychologists and psychiatrists to provide the best outcomes for our patients. And that also includes acupuncture. We use acupuncture to treat mental health. We use it to treat addiction uh, and for pain management. And so building that network of clinicians delivers the best possible health outcomes um, at, from DAP. And uh, so it's for our patients uh, who choose to get their health care at DAP. All of a sudden went silent. Well, with that, I'm going to say Dr. Morris, Dr. Kakar, Trent Brodus, thank you so much. Uh, for your fantastic presentations tonight. We will put more of these presentations up in the future. You'll find it on my chart and by text. And so as soon as we have more information, we'll be back in touch. Thank you, everybody. Take great care of yourselves. And uh, we'll talk soon. Good night. Thanks, dude.